The issue I want to talk about are the rules of jurisdiction uh, in the European Union. Um, those rules are established by something known as the Brussels I regulation. And to see why this was something that the European Union thought was necessary to regulate at the EU level, uh, we need to go back to the whole idea that lies under the um, uh, Brussels I regulation. And that is to make it easy to enforce judgments from one member state in another member state's courts. For example, if you've gotten judgment in France, it should be fairly easy to get that judgment enforced in the UK. The idea behind that is pretty simple. If you can't enforce judgments in other member states, then you're going to be reluctant to do business with people from other member states. Uh, so the idea, the whole idea behind the European Union is that people should be just as willing to buy goods from France as they are from the UK if they live in the UK. And if people cannot enforce judgments, they'll be reluctant to do that. So the main goal here is to say to courts in France and England, you can trust judgments that were entered in France the same as if they were entered in England and you can enforce them just as easily. But if that's your goal, there's a problem because historically the courts in member states applied very different rules to decide which cases they could take jurisdiction over. And furthermore, in a lot of those uh, jurisdictions, other jurisdictions regarded their rules as exorbitant or as outrageous. And they therefore would not enforce judgments rendered uh, by those other courts. And I'll give you some examples of how that uh, worked out in practice. France, the first example, uh, the favorite butt of complaints by the English. Uh, France has a rule still has this rule that says that French courts can take jurisdiction over any case in which the plaintiff is French, even if it has nothing to do with France and if nobody's ever been in France. For example, let's say a French tourist gets involved in an automobile accident in California uh, and is seriously injured. Now the defendant, a California driver, may have never even been to France, but under, under the French law, a French, the French plaintiff can go back home, sue the California person uh, for this automobile accident that took place in California, uh, and the California resident's going to have to come to France to defend the case. Most other jurisdictions regard that as pretty outrageous, that, uh, that a French court can take jurisdiction over a case just because the plaintiff happens to be French. Indeed, they only have to be a citizen of France, they don't even have to live in France. So this California automobile accident could have involved a French citizen who hadn't lived in France for dozens of years, uh, but still was entitled to sue in France and to put the defendant to the expense of coming uh, to France to defend the claim. So that's one example. Second example is the German law, which has been changed recently, but until recently, the German rule was that if you owned property in Germany, you could be sued in Germany for anything. So there was a notorious case involving a French skier who left some underwear in a hotel room in Germany. And somebody wanted to sue him in Germany and so they said, okay, he owns this underwear which he left in a hotel room in Germany, therefore we can sue him in Germany even though the case has nothing whatsoever to do with Germany and even though the amount that he's being sued for is worth way more than the value of the underwear. And furthermore, he couldn't avoid this by saying, look, you can keep the underwear. Uh, I just don't want to go to Germany to, uh, to hear the case. Well, again, other countries would regard that particular assertion of jurisdiction as outrageous and would refuse to enforce judgments. And now a third example. Now, to be fair, I'll pick on one where the English do something outrageous. And that is, the English rule is that as long as you are served with process you know, in, the, uh, in England, you can be sued in England. And in a very famous case called the Maharani of Baroda case, um, the dispute was over a, the genuineness of a picture that the uh, plaintiff had purchased at an art gallery in Paris. But she wanted to sue in England for various reasons. And so while the defendant was at the Ascot horse races, a very famous set of horse races that are held in the UK every year, uh, the plaintiff caused him to be served with process, and so now he was being sued in England. And the English court said, that's fine, he was in England, 
And if he's served with process in England, he can be forced to litigate in England over a dispute that has nothing to do with England. Neither party lived in England, and the, the painting was bought in France. It would be governed by French law. Nonetheless, the English rule was the case could proceed in England. And again, other countries consider that outrageous. So because of this, because every country had some jurisdictional rules that other countries didn't like and would refuse to enforce, the idea behind the Brussels regulation is we need to first regulate when courts can take jurisdiction so that afterwards um, we can be willing to enforce their judgments. So instead of using these national rules of jurisdiction that most people consider outrageous, we will agree on a common set of reasonable rules of jurisdiction and agree only to use those. But there's an important qualification to that. And that is that while the member states of the European Union agreed not to use these outrageous rules, they only agreed not to use them against each other. And that is the subject of continued controversy uh, with respect to people outside the EU as far as how the EU jurisdictional rules work. That's just one example of the kinds of issues we address in the module that I teach on international business transactions.